Okay, you guys ready? What are we going to do today? European Enlightenment, 17th and 18th century. Boom! Yes. Something like that. Good news is we're, we're going to start with Europe. We're coming back <laughs> to the world that you know. So we're going to start with Europe today. This is going to be easy stuff, things we've talked about or have talked about. We're going to talk about enlightenment, we're going to talk about the scientific revolution, we're going to talk about uh, industrial revolution. And from that, then we're going to talk about colonization. And in this process, we're going to deal with India and the Middle East. Hopefully, I think I've told you this enough times. Okay, so here's North America, South America, England, Europe, Spain, Africa, uh, Middle East, right? Russia, India, China, Japan, Southeast Asia, Australia, something like that. Scale maybe off a little bit. If you remember, we first talked about this spot, right? So we talked about Europe, and then we talked about moving this direction. Then we shifted way the heck over here and talked about China and Japan with a little bit of India, tiny, tiny bit of India, because I, I didn't want to talk about India. I want to talk about India more now. But we also talked about how Europe was interacting. I mean, that was the whole point of your essay, right? Your next spot is going to go let's see, here, India, Middle East, okay, North Africa. This will also have a connection with Europe. Hopefully, you get the, the trend, each unit. I'm starting with the West, I'm actually starting with like the far West, with the Americas, and then I'm going around the world to Asia, uh, Asia, then to the Middle East. And where do you think we're going to end up again? Here. And as I'm doing this, geographically, I'm also doing it chronologically. So this part was 1500s, basically discovery, 1500s and 1600s. This part, even though we spent a lot of time before 1500, the bulk of your question was really 1500 to 1700. 1750, we kind of moved ahead in time. This period is going to be closer 1750 to 1900. So with each region, we're going up at least 100 years, 150, maybe 200 years. Our very last region is to go right back here, and this will be 1900 to 2000. What do you think has happened in the 20th century that did not happen in the 16th century? What was the biggest difference? knowing what we know about the three main themes of this class, which, remember, is the corporate knowledge, cultural identity, and cultural diffusion. And when we first introduced these concepts, we talked about the cultural diffusion between Europe and the Americas and Africa. And then, of course, you just finished a unit talking about the cultural diffusion between Europe and China and Japan. And, in fact some of the cultural diffusion between Japan and China itself, and Korea, we talked about. So now, we're a hundred years later, and of course we're going to talk about the same cultural diffusion between Europe and Indian colonization and the Middle East colonization. So then, what's going to happen in the last unit, the very last one of class, 20th century? When you think 20th century, and you think history, what comes to mind? World Wars. Totally World Wars. Absolutely World Wars. I, 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 it's exactly it. And what, what about the World Wars? You don't need to know it now. We're not there. But just take a guess. What was the World War? How is this different than where we started? Start. Shh. End. Why do we have a world 
war. Do we have any world wars in 1500? Why not? Because they're just beginning to even to discover that they even exist. But by the time you get to the 20th century, you cannot have a war. And, and again, you don't have to know this, but so many of you already do. Where does World War I start? The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So we have the Eastern Front and we have the Western Front. The Eastern Front is between Russia and Germany and uh, uh, Russia and Austria and the Ottomans. And the Western Front is going to be France, Belgium, England, and Germany. But why do we call it a world war? Who else is involved? The world. The United States, Japan, the world. The, the war starts with one person being assassinated in Europe, and yet the whole world gets caught in that. How did that happen? Because it certainly didn't happen here, but it does in the 20th century. Because we are tied to everything. And we have our fingers everywhere. And so you can't have a conflict in Europe without also having conflicts everywhere. Now I know you don't know this, I'll tell you. Your textbooks hate my interpretation of world history. The more recent your textbook, the less likely they're going to focus on Europe interacting with these people. Because they want to talk about how in India and China and Japan were all kind of their own folks, and they didn't really care about Europe. And that Africa was on its own, and America was really on its own. And that Europe was just one of many. And you can make that argument. Lots of your books do that. Especially the very recent world history textbooks. They go out of their way to put less attention on Europe. But for us, every single unit, I go back to Europe. Today you would call that Eurocentric. Like we keep thinking about Europe as if it's the big deal. Okay, why do I do that? One of Europe's goals was to go explore. Yes, because it is a big deal. Why wasn't it China that went out? It's a question that you guys asked last unit. Why not Japan? What was it that caused Asia to be different than the West? And it's not because they were backwards. They had just as much technology. They didn't do it. Why do we have 2016 celebrated in China? Is that their calendar? Do they celebrate 2016 years since the birth of Christ? I mean, that's what the calendar starts from, right? Why do the Muslims have this calendar? Russia, Africa, South America. It, because it, it moves. If you want to get the theme of this class, it's about the expansion of corporate knowledge through cultural diffusion. It's a different world in 1500. Totally different world than it was in 2000. And it has to do with just how small the world is. So now we're kind of in the middle part. We know where we're going. We know we're going to end up with the world wars. And not just the world wars, of course. We're also going to talk about Cold War and decolonization, which you guys probably don't think about very much. It's not talked about as much, but it's a huge part of the Cold War. So how do we get from Asia over here? What's this part all about? In some of you read, but my guess is that not a single one of you did, because it was spring break, right? So what would you be thinking about? Okay. It's okay. We'll work on this. Take a guess based on your common knowledge that you brought with you today. What are we going to be talking about here that we haven't really talked about yet? Of course, we've got this stuff, right? Oh, we have this stuff. Colonization. Did, have we really talked about colonization? This is subtle, and you may not get it instantly, so I'll explain it to you, then you'll get it. What's the difference between exploration and colonization? Isn't making something a colony kind of like a part of the 
truth. Did they take it over in a sense? Yes, kind of. Go ahead. Exploration is like just going there and like seeing what you have, and then colonization would be like settling in, like yes. staying and like trying to build a civilization. Okay. You guys are both right, but there's an element that you're not thinking about. When I tell it to you, you'll say, okay, obviously. Is it when you take your corporate knowledge with you with this? Okay, but can you not do that? I mean, is it possible for you not to do that? I, I mentioned this from the very beginning of the class. We make fun of the Spanish for being so mean to the poor Americans. What, what was the alternative? Let's say that they were as politically correct PC types as we are today. Would it have made it any difference? Would the Aztec Empire continue to have thrived? No. The people didn't like it. They were already in their own revolutions. The Incas was already in revolution long before the Spanish got there. Cultural diffusion is inevitable. It's not possible not to carry with you. But there is something different. And it's a technical thing you may not know. So let me just tell you now. It has to do with economics. In the beginning, and I'll say then and now, do this again. And now, and this would be, I don't want to say 2000, because we're, we're only going to go up to 1900, right? So let's, let's put it at 1900, because that's this unit, right? So then, exploration was literally exploration. But the thing is, the reason why this is confusing is, what did Columbus get for discovering the New World? even though we know he didn't really understand there was a new continent. They didn't understand that until like 18, uh, 15, 15. Close to 20 years later, we discover, hey, this is the America Vespucci. This is, this is a new continent. This is an Asia. It takes a while to get that, so almost 20 years. But what does he get for this? Do you remember? No. The point is, at this time, we think colonization, but what we're really thinking of is feudalism. Feudalism is a time when land was money. I'm pretty sure we talked about this, right? Land was wealth. Didn't I talk about this? Because I had to explain what the difference of the modern nation states was. It was the first... It was the first unit. It was explaining why Europe was so much ahead of the Americas in Africa. They had a concept of a modern nation state that was beginning to arise, but in the Middle Ages, no concept of modern nation state. Feudalism meant land equals wealth. Your wealth is based off of your land, which is why they're all struggling over Columbus. They're just struggling, struggling over possibly on all these guys. What changes? This is going to help to explain colonization. Colonization is not feudal based. Does anybody know what it is? Any of you guys who had my U.S. history you should know this, but you may not remember. It's the very first lecture or so in U.S. history, if you take U.S. history one. Go ahead. Wasn't it a way for them to expand like, the system of the empire? <laughs> Yes! I mean, that's the whole point of colonization. That's what, that's what colonization... But why? Because Spain wanted to expand its empire, but he wasn't doing it like they were doing it in 1800s. It, was, it wasn't the same. It wasn't really a colony. England had colonies. And I talk about this in United States history. Why does England send people off to the United States? Are they looking for wealth? Not really. I, this is hard to explain, but if, if land equals wealth, why is land wealth? This is kind of a subtext of feudalism. Remember, you don't have slavery in Europe. Feudalism is, a, is, a, is kind of a personal relationship between the lord and the vassal. And at the very beginning, the lord says, I will give you this land... As long as you promise me your sword every time I need you, remember? And so he goes off to that land. What does he do on that land? Builds a castle, right? And then what does he get? Because the land really isn't that valuable. 
What makes the land valuable? People! That's exactly it. It's the people who are on it. The castle and the people, because people start coming out of the woodwork saying, I will work for you. I don't have a sword or a horse. I can't be your knight, but I'll work for you if you let me stay behind your castle. So it's not actually that land per se is wealth. It's always the people that are on. Go back to population. Prior to the 20th century, population was always wealth. If population is wealth, and we look here at the Americas, where's the wealthiest stuff? And you know this about the Americas, right? You know about the Americas. We've already discovered this. Where is the greatest wealth? If population is wealth, where is the greatest wealth? Central America. Central America. Boom. Okay? Absolutely. Where else is wealth? Let's say you can't get to Central America. And the fact is, you guys know this, there was, uh, there was certain currents that Spain had that was told that the reason why Columbus discovered is the currents were taking him right there. He didn't know where he was going. But it just so happened that there's a current that goes right off of Spain, right into Central America. Hardly anyone is going to be able to compete with that. None of the other countries can do that. Not to mention the right of discovery. Spain was there first. Portugal was going to come right after. They divided up. But really, these guys have the advantage. So you can't go here. So where else could you possibly get wealth? Well, that's on the other side, right? Oh, Yes, Portugal goes down and they go, they go directly. In fact, that is exactly, that was what caused Columbus to go west in the first place, was to try to find the spice trade. And so what we're talking about here is different. This is wealth based off of people and population, but this wealth is based off of trade, right? Trade, trade. So if you're looking at the rest of North and South America, where is the other valuable spot? It's not the people. How about all the furs up in Nova Scotia and in northern Canada? Trappers, right? There's a great deal of wealth. In fact, tons of French and English businesses were based off of that fur trade. You went out there, you got valuable things that are intrinsically valuable. Great. So this is valuable because you're actually getting wealth. Now, of course, you realize that this was wealthy only because there are people here. This is wealthy because it's actually like picking up gold on the ground. What's this area in between where the United States lies? Totally useless. And the only reason why the English allowed us to go there is that the French had the north, the Spanish had the central and the south, Portugal had this section. Where can the English go? In between. And in 1600, how big is England in Europe? That big. Can they actually threaten France? Not unless they want to get their butts kicked. Or, or Spain, for that matter? Nobody is threatening Spain. Not yet. And it will a little bit later. And so England sets his people there only as a placeholder. It takes about 100 years. Now, if you do American history, we do quite a bit in 100 years. By the time we get to 1750, we are really eager to have our own voice because we're like England removed. But we are totally unique among everybody else because we're there actually living there. We are a colony, really in the most true sense of the word, but it was accidental. The people in Spain aren't colonies, they're like governors. Just like you're sending out your, your feudal lord, he's the, the lord, he's got the land out there, but the people on the land really are doing all this stuff. It's the whole reason why we have the slave trade, is so that the people on the land can do this stuff. So then we go back here. What's the difference between feudalism and colonization? And you don't know the answer, but I'll tell it to you. Old mercantilism. Anybody remember what that is? Is that like well, money? Boom! Well, money is wealth. And you can see where we get that. Land is wealth, right? But it's really people. There's, a, there's an in-between part that France was doing this. In fact, the whole spice trade were intrinsic values. Intrinsic valuables are wealth. So furs are wealth, spices are wealth. But that's a limit. 
if you go out to try to dig out all the gold in South America, what's going to happen? You're going to run out of gold. All the furs in northern Canada are going to run out of furs. This isn't something where you can make a ton of money. And so if you look at this, and I want, it, I want you to see time. 1500, 1900. Spain, totally feudal. Feudal. Spain, Portugal, these guys are like in the Middle Ages still. They're thinking land. In this middle part, France. And in fact, even some of the, um, the Scandinavian countries. The Netherlands, right? The Dutch. These guys are looking for intrinsic valuables. What is different is in mercantilism, money is wealth. If money is wealth, it's not really about finding cash. I think we talked about this, right? You must have, right, Kath, uh, uh, Karen? Because you, you, you knew what the answer was, right? When, when did we talk about this? Did we talk about this? Was it in the first year? I think it was in the first year. Okay, it, it's not money, it's profit. More gold goes in than goes out. It's the definition of profit, right? That's money. And so if you can get a favorable trade balance, then you're going to get money. Mercantilism. Well, no. now we look at colonization. Here's the mommy country. So we're England. Now, if you remember, England. If you remember, um, England's not a really big country. Now, they do happen to have this colony here in the Americas, but what happens to the colony in the Americas? They break away. Bad example. They do happen to have colonies in Canada, but they didn't start those colonies. Who started them? France. In fact, they stole them, right? French and Indian War. And in fact, they have colonies over here in India. But in the 1700s, they don't actually have India. They are there with a whole bunch of other people, like the Dutch, and like the Portuguese, and like the French, and like other folks, right? And so everybody and their uncle is over here in India. Nobody has a monopoly on India. Mercantilism is the idea, and English the ones that truly understand this. Mercantilism is the idea that your colony provides raw goods, things that are flat cheap, right? You send them back to the mommy country. The mommy country then finishes them. So I send wood back to England, and I turn the wood into tables. And then I sell that table back to the colony. And so I sell the finished goods. Not only am I selling it to my colony, but where else am I selling it to? I'm selling it to Africa. I'm going to sell it to India. I'm going to sell it to wherever I can. Because I've got cool technology, and my tables are going to look better than any of the tables that the uh, Aborigines do. And when I do that, because this is finished, it's a high price. What have I established? Buy low, sell high. What do I got? Profit. Profit. That's money. That's the source of money. It's the new, it's the new age. So we, we get money this way. Profit. And so you can see a connection between mercantilism and colonization. What do these empires want? In order to get, they want colonies everywhere. I don't know what I told you. I'm sure I did. Uh, what's one of the reasons why you can look in some of your textbooks, and some of your textbooks are just really awful about this, and hear about all the terrible things that Columbus did? Maybe I explain this? Went out and systematically killing people, and, and, and deliberately uh, raping the women, and, and, and just trying to, to kill as many Indians as possible. And you get that some of your textbooks talk about that. And you think... How could you put that in the textbook if there's no source for it? Well, there is a source for it. Did I, did I not talk about this? His journal? No, 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 no. You read his journal, and he's talking about thanking God like every other minute. 
has nothing to do about raping women, ever. Right? He's talking about spreading God's word. He's also talking about, wouldn't it be great if we got a ton of money? Found some gold or spices, because if you remember, he was sent with a purpose. Now, with Queen Isabella, the purpose was to spread the faith. But what was the other goal? Right? To get something, to make it work. They spent a lot of money sending him out. And he comes back and says, well, I had a blast. No, no money, totally not. It was a waste of money on your side. But boy, did I have a lot of fun. Not going to happen, right? He has to justify why they gave the expense. So he's looking for spices. But you really have to understand, what's the likelihood, what in all likelihood is going to happen to Columbus? And just think for a second, if there was no New World, what would have happened? Like it went from Europe all the way to, to China. What would have happened to Columbus? This is an easy one, right? Just think, world same size, no North and South America, and you go from Europe. Oh, you would have died. You died! There's no question. There's absolutely no, no problem about it at all. Totally dead. So, the guy who's going on this trip, his likelihood is he's going to die, which is totally why, by the way, Ferdinand did not give him any money. Isabella, because she's kind of like a saint, says, I'll give you money. So that before you die, you can spread the word out to people. Well, you're going to die. Nobody expects you to survive this. So the guy who's on this, it doesn't matter if you've got a trillion dollars for doing this. If you die, what's the value? Zero. It's not worth anything. So that's not why you do this. You, you read his journal, you can see that it's because it's out there. It's exploration. He wants to do this. And most of the explorers are doing that. But the people that are footing the bill, that are at home, that never leave their castle, they want a return. Totally makes sense. So, the reason why I say this is that the explorers are trying to find this. Well, Lynette's talking about they're, they're going out, right? But from the get-go, Columbus, as his reward, gets like Cuba. That's his reward, right? Whatever you conquer, if you saw it first, you get to claim it. Then it goes back to the question, why do we have all these terrible stops? Well, what happens to Columbus? Does anybody know? Within like, oh, I don't know, a decade of him finding the new world. He dies. He dies. So who gets it afterwards? His country. His heirs get it. But is it absolutely a certain, because did the heirs actually discover? It's the right of his discovery. You discover, you get to name it, you get to own it, right? For at least govern it. So what if uh, you die in your heirs? They didn't do this. But, you know, you, go, you die with a million dollars, your kids get the million dollars. So you die with the rights to own, and remember this is feudalism, this isn't modern nation states. You, have, you die with the right to govern, say, Cuba. Then who gets that right? Well, the kids, unless you can convince the king that they don't deserve that right. And what would be the best way to convince the king that they don't deserve this right? Show the Columbus of that. <laughs> totally. That's exactly what it is. If you look, and you have to realize this is 1492, 1500. This is before modern nation states. This is way back in feudalism. 1400s feudalism. And so they're thinking feudal stuff. Lords, manners, they don't have modern nation states. They don't have wealth defined by money. It's defined by land. And so you go back to the Spanish court and you read some of this stuff. They are fighting each other left and right. Part of the reason why we know about Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon discovers Florida. What do you remember about Ponce de Leon? I told you about this. I'm writing this book. What's he doing? Fountain of Youth. Did he actually go out and discover Florida looking for the Fountain of Youth? No, he was trying to find another island. And if you look at Florida, right? If you've been to Cuba, huge giant island. If you've been to the Dominican Republic, huge giant island. Puerto Rico, huge giant island. You go down to the bottom of Florida, what do you think it is? Island. A big giant island, right? It's the Keys. He wants another island. That's why he's there. But he dies, like, in his discovery. He gets kicked up. Uh, uh, hit in the leg with an arrow from one of the natives, goes back to Cuba, dies a terrible, painful death. 
So by right, his heirs get to rule Florida. Unless, kind of a crazy man, what would be the best way to say the crazy man? Totally irresponsible. He just went out totally wild, right? He, he was looking for the fountain of youth. It's shocking how much, it's like us knowing, trying to learn about the political processes reading the National Enquirer, you know, 200 years from now. Oh, I got these really good, you didn't know this. <laughs> Kennedy was in space here. And he's still alive, he fakes his death. <laughs> and that's your source material. Yeah, it's 500 years old, right? Well, 500 years from now, they can still look at this. Is that credible? No, because they're, they're fighting. They're, they're deliberately trying to smear the other side. We get that from Columbus. We get this from most of the people. Now, if you happen to be one of these guys that's not progressive type or dialectical side, and all you're trying to find out is how horrible the Europeans are, which, which sources do you want to use? Hey, it says, this guy said that Columbus was out there literally raping whenever he could. Now, we won't look at Columbus's diary because he lied. But not this guy. He knows Columbus is a scuzzball extraordinary. The point is, at this time, we think colonization, but what we're really thinking of is feudalism. What is different is in mercantilism, money is wealth. If money is wealth, it's not really about finding cash. I think we talked about this, right? You must have, right, Cap uh, 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 Karen? Because you, you, you knew what the answer was, right? Where, when did we talk about this? Did we talk about this? Was it in the first unit? I think it was in the first unit. Yeah. Okay. It, it's not money. It's profit. More gold goes in, then goes out. It's the definition of profit, right? That's money. And so if you can get a favorable trade balance, then you're going to get money. Mercantilism. No, no, we look at colonization. Here's the mommy country. So we're England. Now if you remember, England. If you remember, um, England's not a really good country. Now, they do happen to have this colony here in the Americas, but what happens to the colony in the Americas? They break away. Bad example. They do happen to have colonies in Canada, but they didn't start those colonies. Who started them? France. France. In fact, they stole them, right? French and Indian War. And in fact, they have colonies over here in India. But in the 1700s, they don't actually have India. They are there with a whole bunch of other people, like the Dutch, and like the Portuguese, and like the French, and like other folks, right? And so everybody and their uncle is over here in India. Nobody has a monopoly on India. Mercantilism is the idea, and English the ones that truly understand this. Mercantilism is the idea that your colony provides raw goods, things that are flat, cheap, right? You send them back to the mommy country. The mommy country then finishes them. So I send wood back to England, and I turn the wood into tables. And then I sell that table back to the colony. And so I sell the finished goods. Not only am I selling it to my colony, but where else am I selling it to? I'm selling it to Africa. I'm going to sell it to India. I'm going to sell it to wherever I can. Because I've got cool technology, and my tables are going to look better than any of the tables that the uh, Aborigines do. When I do that, because this is finished, it's a high price. What have I established? Buy low Sell high, what do I got? Profit! That's money, that's the source of money, it's the new, it's the new age. So we, we get money this way. Profit! And so you can see a connection 
between mercantilism and colonization. What do these empires want in order to get? They want colonies everywhere. But don't get me wrong. America is a huge example. When you study American history, we talk about the shot heard around the world. Does anybody remember what that is? It's in Boston. Boston. It's when um, Battle of Lexington and Concord. Yes, go ahead, tell me. It's when there was a standoff between the British and the Americans. Yes. And they both had their guns drawn. Yes. And they put a gun shot. No one knows who fired it. It might have been a hunter, I think. Could have been, never know. And that's what started the war between our industrial the Revolutionary War. war. Revolutionary Totally. Why is it the shot heard around? I mean, was it physically heard beyond those guys? No. It caused them to fight when they weren't fighting before. If you think about this, the colony breaking away from the mother country, had that ever happened before, prior to the Americans? No. 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 We've had revolutions. That happens all the time. Try to top your own government. But having a colony made of your own people breaking away from the motherland? doesn't happen. And this was a big deal. England sunk a lot of money. This is an eight-year war, 1776 to 1782. But in fact, we started fighting in 1775. So we're there for a very long time. What don't they want to ever happen again? So what's the lesson that England takes from this? What, was the, what did they do wrong with the United States? They allowed too much freedom. Totally. But... but do we have a point? I mean, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Do we have a point? Especially since this is English, right? Who came up with that phrase? John Locke. John Locke, who was? British. He was an English. <laughs> it's his ideas. It's his ideas. That's why Thomas Jefferson wrote them, because he knew full well the English Parliament believed it. It was their justification for kicking out the king and making the parliament leader. So they totally believed this. If you believe this, then did you give them too much freedom? No. No, you actually gave them too little freedom. And there's a lot of debate over this. And we hardly ever do this because we just don't have time. But if you ever study English history about the American Revolution, there was a lot of debate. People saying... <laughs> Give them representation. They say no representation without, no taxation without representation. Give them representation. You're going to lose this. You're going to screw this up. And the people that were saying that were right. They looked back and said, see, I told you. And English colonial policy changed as a result. They wouldn't do it anymore. And so how do they do this? What's the solution? If we didn't give them enough rights, what do we do? Give them more rights. How? It's hard, but it's actually really important. It's not feudalism. Feudalism was that you go over to the other territory, like Spain takes over Mexico, and you create a governor, but what you're really doing, feudalism is about land, so you're creating manners. The best way for us to understand this in American history is think of a plantation. That's where they got their wealth. They would have people on the plantation. Well, this isn't slavery like in the United States slavery that we're thinking about south in the 1800s. This is actually what dominated most of the Middle Ages from the fall of Rome up to the modern era for a thousand years. They weren't being cruel and unusual. That's all they knew. So you divide this up, you have the lord of this estate, and all these people are vassals. And these lords are all vassals to the king back home. Right? That's feudalism. And it doesn't work because over time, these guys might decide to just be their own folks. That Nobody wants to do that. But on the other hand, what happens if you just have the country being ruled by the crown and all your other Brits are just being forced and you're using the colony purely to get more wealth, which is exactly what it's for, right? That's the whole point of mercantilism. We sell them, the finished products, we tax the hex out of them. What's the third option? Third option is that we don't have the English here at all. 
you might have an English governor, but they don't have plantations. I mean, they may have some few people, but who's really running the government? In India, who, if you're arrested, if you're an Indian, and you get arrested, who are you going to be in front of? The locals. Other Indians. It, it, it's going to be locals. Now, if you do this right, then these guys will never want to break away from England, right? Because of why? Because they still rely on England. Totally. But they see England is a pipeline of cultural diffusion. What could England possibly give to these locals? This is an easy one, right? Money, guns, technology. They give them whatever they need for these locals to be above their neighbors. Because it's corporate knowledge base. This corporate knowledge base is much higher than their corporate knowledge base. This isn't, you know, saying that they're heathens or whatnot, it's just a reality. They don't have the technology in India. The locals can't do it, but the English can. And if you can give some of that high technology stuff over to a few locals, not all, just a few, and make these guys rulers, then all you have to do is have just a few folks and say, well, you're in charge. How is this different from the feudalism? And I, I'm not going to say this, I'm going to ask you, so you guys have to switch the gear on, instead of listening, and, and tell me, how is this different from feudalism? You have to remember what feudalism is. What do you do in feudalism? What defined feudalism? There's a connection between lords and the king. That's right. So who, the lord in the feudal place in Spain, right? Who is that guy? He's the lord. Sure. He's the guy who founded the island, right? Columbus's people. He's the guy who, uh, Ponce de Leon's guy. He's the guy that was handpicked by the leader to rule. What about the folks that are on his plantation? The locals that work for him. Yeah. Peasants, right? Just like you had back in the Middle Ages, they're peasants. This is what you do. How is that different from colonization? Locals run themselves. In colonization, the locals oh, are going to be the lords, right? Yeah. The locals are going to be in charge of the plantation. The locals are going to be doing local government. Well, why would this benefit England at all? What's the whole purpose of mercantilism? If wealth is not defined by land, does it matter if you've got 20 square feet of a port or if you've got 20,000 miles? Because where's your wealth? People. It, that's well, feudalism. In the profit. It's totally the profit, right? Totally the profit. So if that's the case... Go ahead. So it's basically like they don't really care who's running uh, America as long as they're making a profit. Totally! It's just you know, you, what you want more than anything. You want peace. And isn't this ironic? Because when we think of colonization, what do we normally think? Europeans going in there bashing heads, breaking, you know, Columbus. And the thing is, part of this is that we do not distinguish between the explorers and the colonies. But it's a huge difference. Columbus is part of the old feudal system. He wants his plantation. But when we get into colonization, you're not running plantation. You might have one, especially in parts of Africa towards the late 1800s. You might have a coffee plantation. But here, you're actually a businessman. You're just a farmer. You're settling out there. In the beginning, England doesn't like that. Because the next question is, the first question is, what's the difference between colonization and feudalism? Well, the second question, what's the difference between colonization and what the United States was? Why did we break away? Why is this really not want us to come up again? In a plantation, the local, uh, the Spanish guy is in charge of the locals who are working for him. But in the Americas, you might have an English governor, but who's, who's doing all the work? Yeah, the South is obviously an exception. But if you remember, why did we have a meeting against this? 
why was there the Civil War? Because the South was like a holdover of old feudalism. And the North was like the modern mercantile trade base. Two different types of society. They couldn't continue to exist. The reason why the United States was a danger to England is that you have little England way over there. If they were trained in England and they're now over there, what's to prevent them from using all of English's resources? I mean, right off the bat. Whose idea was we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed by the Creator with certain noble rights? Is this an American who wrote this? No, it's an English person that wrote this. So you're taking all the corporate knowledge, the best of the corporate knowledge of England, and you're just taking it and just giving it to them. Are, would you, if you were English, put up with being a colony? Like England being a colony? Fat chance. Instead, that lack of putting up with it is what we exported to the United States. They don't want that anymore. So the modern colonization keeps the guys separate. Do we want, do we really want to be giving all of our secrets. We give some, we give them money, we give them guns, we give them some technology, but do we want them to have all the secrets? We'll train a few of them, but they take care of themselves. They make sure there's peace. And that way, we just deal with profit. Because that's the whole purpose of colony, is to have more profit. You have all these colonies. In some spots, it may be a trading port. In India, at the very beginning, you had maybe 20 different ports. But of course, with mercantilism, it's a problem, because you have to have the raw material coming in, so this has to be cheap, and then you have to be able to sell the finished product. What happens if you've got the Dutch, who's doing the same thing, they're right next to you? What may happen? Yes, they might be also selling raw materials, but they may be the ones that are selling the finished product back and not you. So you're buying cheap goods, but you can't sell the finished product. So no profit. Totally a bad idea. Or, this is even worse, you can't get the raw materials. So you're getting these expensive items, but you have to pay a lot of money for those items. Either one is a terrible idea. So, imperialism, this sense of colonization is going to usually lead to what? When you have all these ports right next to each other, what's it going to lead to, generally speaking? Peace? Why not? The, the irony of all ironies. What do they want more than anything in their colony? Peace. They do. They really want it, so they can just trade. But that's the locals. Right? When you're talking about the Germans or the French or the Portuguese or the Spanish, you don't want them to be in there. So, oddly enough, we're going to be fighting with each other quite a bit.
Well, you had to invent the plow and the three crop system and the padded um, um, harness before that, close to the 1100s, right? But it takes a while for this to really result because what's the whole purpose of an agricultural revolution? What does this provide you that you didn't have before? More food. Food, which gives you people. And people gives you more specialization. And more specialization gives you more complex government. And more complex government gives you more technology. You remember that? That's like the beginning of civilization. But you guys all thought that that's only what happened at the very start of civilization. But the formula works continuously, which is one of the reasons why everyone saw population as a good thing. Because it allows you to do more stuff, more people, more specialization. More food, more people. And so then what comes up next? Well, scientific revolution. The scientific revolution was basically our systematic attempt to try to understand the world. The science. That's the switch from faith in God to faith in science, right? It is. It takes a long time. And in fact, at this time, in the 1500s, when this is really beginning, 1500 scientific revolution, all these scientists are religious. We talked about this. They're all religious. Because you better understand God by understanding his creation. You don't get a break from science and faith really until the 1800s. And that's actually going to be what the Enlightenment does. Scientific revolution is simply inductive reasoning. Do you know what inductive reasoning is? We talked about this. Sherlock Holmes, remember? He walks into a room. He sees the body. Does he have to prove that there's a dead body there? He's got it. You use deductive reasoning to look at all the possible options and then deduce, kind of deduct, remove things that don't fit to come up with an answer. Oddly enough, we think Sherlock Holmes, modern science guy, but deductive reasoning is what we had in the Middle Ages. We know that God exists. We know nature. We know that kings are kings. We don't question it. So we explain why. We know that the sun rises and sets. Why do we know this? Because we see it every day. How stupid of a question is that? Inductive reasoning is the exact opposite. I come into the room and I don't know anything. I don't trust anything. I have to be proven everything. So, okay, I see the earth of the sun rise, but that doesn't mean that that's what it is. It could be something else. I have to find out. In fact, we happen to know it's not what happens. What happens? Why do we see the sun rise and set? Because we rotate. Because we rotate, right? But how would you know that? Well, if you invent a telescope and you can look at the phases of Venus and you can look at uh, the phases of the moons on other planets, and you can realize you can't get those angles unless there's a sun in the middle. So you can prove it. Go ahead. What would the definition of inductive reasoning be? Inductive reasoning is to assume nothing and to test your conclusion. That's your definition. You assume nothing and you test through experimentation. That's why you guys think of the scientific method. Francis Bacon comes up with this. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm thinking that this sort of new idea of testing things has really is like them becoming enlightened. Is that not okay, right? not right. Good guess, though. And why? And I'll just be honest with you, because the enlightened people use that to define their identity. The science folks were all Christian. They are all deeply religious. Francis Bacon was deeply religious. He was also the guy who invents the scientific method. There's no break between faith and reason. You use science and reason to understand your faith. They're completely tied together. But you're thinking enlightened science because something else happened. So, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning were not incompatible. They were two different things, two different types of knowledge. For God, you don't prove that God exists. You can't. You just flat, you can't. Because he's not material. You can't touch him. So you can't weigh and measure and test. So you know that he exists. And this is the funny thing. Which gives you more certainty? Deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning? They both give you a sense of certainty. 
Well, it depends on what you're talking about. In science, can you ever be absolutely certain that your theory is going to No, because somebody else can come up with a different idea. Deductive, you start off, he's dead. Let's explain it. You start off with it. The certainty is actually greater with deductive reasoning. We know God exists. We don't prove this. You know it. It's written into your heart. You know it. It's a certain assurance. But if we know that God exists and that he loves us, then we can deduce all sorts of things called theology. In the 14, 13, 14, 15, even 1600s, the queen of all sciences is theology. Because that would be the source of all truth. It's not until later. What happens is with the Enlightenment, we question this. And what the Enlightenment does is we use science to solve social problems. What we did with the scientific revolution is we're using inductive reasoning to solve material problems. The best example is when we're understanding the heliocentric theory. Helio, sun is in the center, as opposed to geocentric, earth is in the center. It's material, we can measure it. And of course it fits perfectly with experimentation and measurement. We don't use science to understand theology. Nobody even dares, because it doesn't make any sense. Francis Bacon, deeply religious, also huge on scientific method. If you're not testing things, it's not true. But you don't test your faith in God. You just know that. What the Enlightenment does is starts using scientific method. And we can see where this works. The United States is sometimes referred to as the child of the Enlightenment the first daughter of the Enlightenment. Because we ask, why do kings rule? What's the answer? Because we let them. We have to figure it out. Can you use a scientific method to figure this out? You can use inductive reasoning. You can use deductive reasoning. They rule because God wants them to rule. Divine right of kings happens when the king does really horrible things. Does God really want horrible things to be happening? So then you start testing it. I don't believe that kings should rule. Then if I don't believe the king should rule, then what should happen? What should be the case? Yeah, John Locke. We hold these truths to be self-evident. This is a deductive truth. Self-evident means you don't have to prove this. All men are created equal. They're Endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. We don't prove this. We know it. That's the deductive side. Go ahead. Now, you said people thought that God wouldn't want a king who did terrible things. Yeah. Now, what if, could they have taken that the other way and say there is no God because that king is doing terrible things? That's a good question. Not then. Okay. Then they would say, no, no. He's, he's not doing what God wants him to do, right? That's the one side. But the other guy would say, no, no. The whole nature of king. Have you ever seen a really good king? You, every time you get there, you get the wealth, you get the power, you start being corrupted. So it's the nature. This John Locke argument is kind of a combination, but it is scientific theory. If we hold that all men are created equal and doubt whether they're created certain animal rights, then these things follow. And so you don't have a kingdom, you have a democracy. That's kind of the first alignment. So when we start thinking about alignment, we usually think in terms of politics. And for the United States, for example, we're all in favor of politics. Political enlightenment. And basically we're saying, we decide these things. The people decide. What happens in the French Revolution? Did we talk about this? Maybe not in this class. We haven't been up there yet. But in the French Revolution, what do you start saying? You know, in the American Revolution... The colony is separated from England. And so for us to break away, we just break the connection. But what about the French Revolution? Where, where are the people? They're all in France. So how do you break that connection? By killing everyone. You have to transform society and start questioning everything. And what they start doing is they start questioning the church. They start questioning theology. They start questioning God. And so your idea about bad king... We don't believe in God. That's exactly what they did. And that is enlightenment thought. And so this will bring up a sense of atheism. It gets triggered 
first, but it doesn't succeed because France is not something anybody wants to repeat. You invent the guillotine in order to kill that many more people because you're just, you're just, if you don't agree with them, you get killed. There's no standard. The standard is whatever you think. So Robespierre, who's the guy who's killing thousands and thousands of people, what happens to him? He gets killed too because there's no standard. So nobody wants to do that. And in fact, the irony of ironies, we'll talk about this, but the French Revolution inspires this rebel, this getting rid of the king. They kill the king. Well, who comes up within five years? Napoleon. Who gets crowned emperor? The king of kings. Because he restores order. They want that. So these ideas, not all in favor. The Enlightenment bringing about this is really going to be a trouble. By the time you get to the 1850s, we start thinking of the Enlightenment as atheism, as thinking science only. It takes a long time for that to happen. After the Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but let me just say, the Industrial Revolution is going to be what fixes imperialism and mercantilism. Because every time you bring the raw materials home, what do you have to do in order to get your profit? Make it as cheap as possible. And so, industrial revolution is when you replace human labor with machine labor. And so you're able to transform the raw material into finished products so much quicker. And if you can do that, then your wealth is going to skyrocket. Take a wild guess where the Industrial Revolution begins. England. England. And who is the most powerful empire in the world 20 years after it sweeps through England? England. England. It's totally, it's what happens. And since we know that cultural diffusion is inevitable, even though we don't want these guys to be industrialized, what do you think is going to inevitably happen, say, by 1950? India will be... Industrialized. Yeah, more industrialized. They're still not industrialized. But they'll be more industrialized because you can't stop culture. It takes a long time, maybe 200 years. We'll talk about that. Questions, comments, words of wisdom? We will see you guys on Wednesday.